So uh, I just want to jump right in the word. That's uh, it's really important to God that we do that. Not just hearing our, our own stories, but to just chew on the word. Amen. So one more time on your heart. Could you put your hand on your heart? Lord, I receive what you want to say to me today. I want to open up my horizons and my understanding of the truth that I would receive nourishment from the bread of life today. Amen. Thank you all for being willing to hang in there. My uh, text verse is from Isaiah 64, verse 1. And uh, I, I titled it, Rend the Heavens and Come Down. Anybody familiar with this verse? People who pray tend to be pretty familiar with Isaiah 64, 1, because it's, it's, it's a cry from our heart that I would like to just plant the seed in your heart today that this is a daily prayer. This is something we could ask the Lord every day. This could be a part, not just once a day, this could be all day long. Is Lord, open up the heavens over my life and come down in this situation that I'm in right now. I was there, you know, picking up the food on Friday, and a man walked in, and he had like a little bit of a bitter, I don't know, sense about him. And that's one of those, Lord, rend the heavens right now. Show me what you want me to say to this man. And, and all of a sudden, just like out of nowhere, he said, yeah, um, I threw my stepson out of the house because he got COVID and ignored our warnings and came in the house and my wife died of COVID. Had been married for, I don't know how many years. So, I mean, no, that's a legitimate reason to be upset. And he said, she was amazing. She was a born again Christian. And I never met anybody who loved me the way she did. And uh, you know, like that's not normally the first thing you hear out of somebody's mouth, right? So now, now it's my job to say, rend the heavens, Lord. Open up. What do you want me to say right now, right here to this man I never met before? Because I want, when I open my mouth, I want you to fill it with your words. Rend the heavens over me and come down. Because there's an opportunity here if I'm willing to step through this door that you open. And it would be great if I said, yeah, he fell down on his knees right there and he accepted the Lord. He had already accepted the Lord with his wife prior, but now he had stopped going to church. He was, he was just in one of those bitter places that many of us can get to very easily. And that's what I felt the Lord was showing me to do, was just to minister to him and say, well, what would she want for you right now? Like, how would she want you to live in her absence? Do you think she would want you stuck home, you know, feeding the cat? He was there to get cat food. That was a barter system. He does the plumbing for the food bank and, and, uh, they give him cat food. <laughs> that stupid cat, you know, it was her cat. <laughs> but it's amazing, like I never met the guy, just boom. Like, you ever have that happen where people will say, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but, well, that's the Lord. That's the Lord giving you an opportunity. Take them, you don't get them all the time. Take them when they, when they come before you. But I did know where he lived and I understood the, the local churches in that area and I said, you know, think about what she would want for you. She'd want you to be back in church. She wouldn't want you being alone in the house and she'd want you to be connecting with the brothers and sisters and, and well, I don't like that church. I don't like that new pastor. <laughs> I feel your pain, brother. I know. <laughs> but I did know a pastor of a different church and I said, think about her, man. Think about what she'd want. Right now, it just happened to be in that moment, right? But this is what I'm trying to say, that too many people don't realize God is this active in our lives all the time, just speaking to us. And, and we default to like, well, that's too much work to have to keep my antenna open all the time. I'm having a hard enough time figuring out what I'm supposed to do than to be derailed from my list. Yeah, I could tell some of you know about the list. Let me tell you this, the list never goes away. <laughs> there will always be a list, but there won't always be this person right in front of you that needs to hear what you have to say. The list can wait. Thank you, Trish. She taught me that early on. I was a list person big time. 
that's not all bad, right? Let's not throw Martha under the bus. People do have to prepare the food. <laughs> but it was like, Martha, like, God is in the living room. Like, you think you could stop and go in and listen? Like, does it happen every day? And Mary chose the better thing, amen? Anybody need to be delivered from lists? Stand right now, and I will cast that thing out of you. Let's just unpack the verse a little bit more, okay? In Isaiah 64, 1, it says, If only you would rip open the heavens. That's a little different than rend the heavens, isn't it? Only you would rip open the heavens. If, if we have bad eschatology, we think the world is going down the toilet faster and faster with every day that goes by. It can't get worse. It can't get worse. Lord, hurry up and come back. But wait, let's just stop that thinking for a minute and say, I'm here today. And what's a better attitude to have? Maybe it would be better for me to say, yeah, things are bad in the culture, but you want to use me as a change agent for the kingdom of God and the earth. And what about this part of the formula? The worse and darker it gets out there, the brighter your light shines. And when things are pretty bad right now, so when you have a word in season, when you're sparked by the, the Spirit of God because you're praying, Lord, rend the heavens and come down, be a part of my life. Its heights and depths would quake, he says, the earth, right? If you came down to earth, the heights and depths would quake the moment you appear, the, like kindling, when it just begins to catch fire. What a beautiful picture that is. If you've ever been camping and you know when it's cold, you want to get that fire started quickly and, and you're blowing on it and you, and you get it going, but then all of a sudden, boom, there's like this whoosh that happens. And that's that spark that he wants each of us to be, fire starters. Where, wherever we are, wherever we go. Sometimes it's forgiveness. Sometimes it's being peace in the midst of a difficult situation. You walk into a conference room at work and you could feel in the atmosphere there was an argument going on before you got there. And they're all looking down at their notes and you could just hear them growling on the inside. And like you bring in the peace of God with you. You can't say praise the Lord most of the time, but you can say it inside. <laughs> or like water that's about to boil. See, like, like that kindling or like that water that's about to spark and, and change the condition of itself from just water to boiling water. And we all know what a difference that could be. If only you would come like that so that all who deny or hate you would know who you are. Now look, this man I was talking to didn't hate God, but he had disconnected from him. Kind of, you could say understandably, right? Because the person he loved, he'd never met anyone like her. He, he told me so much about her in just the first few minutes. And, and of course it's going to leave a vacuum and a void. But what's the alternative? Stay home alone? Not a good one. All who deny or hate you would know who you are, and they would tremble at your presence. So my, my message is really around this idea that we could be change agents for the love of God and the earth. If we're willing to keep our hearts open and, and allow the Lord to open the heaven over us, you can't, you could argue with me and say, well, I can't do that 100% of the time, every day of the week. Well, start doing what you can do. And the more the Lord shows up in the middle of your day like this, the more you're going to want to keep doing it. And when Paul said, pray without ceasing, that's what I think he meant. Pray at all times. Keep your antenna up and, and tuned in to the Lord and let him be with you 100% of your day, every day. And yes, there's going to be times that you're doing kind of monotonous things, but you could have your ears, your, your ears in listening to worship music. You could be feeding your spirit with the truth, right? Not, not everything you hear on the internet is going to be truth, but why not nourish yourself on the word of God? And then this commentary says, the prophet Isaiah is convinced that there's no hope apart from God's decisive action when he says, rent the heavens and come down. It's bad down here, Lord. Would you open up the heavens and come down so that the world will see that you're real? They will tremble in your presence. Anybody ever tremble at the presence of God before you knew him? And then he made himself real to you? And say, like, oh boy, this isn't my grandmother's religion. This God is real. He's powerful. Old things that I used to want to do, I don't even want to do them anymore. Remember that song? Places I used to go, I don't go there anymore. <laughs> it's not enough to address God's people and the nations and urge them just to do better next time. The world can't be repaired that way. In fact, it can't be repaired only from this realm, this earthly realm, the below realm. Lasting change 
results from the partnership between above and below. <laughs> and, you're, you know, some of us are sitting there going, well, why can't it just be from above? Why can't he just do it? He chooses us. Huh? Sons and daughters. No man can get to the Father except through the Son. A lot of us can get to an unknown God, but if you want to know what the Father thinks, you've got to know what the Son thinks because they are one. What a beautiful prayer. Lasting change results from this cooperation, right? We cooperate with God, with the Spirit, with the Word of God, every situation. Be careful, right? Religious spirits want you to default and devalue the other person and judge them before you know anything about them. Right? And, and it says in there very carefully, some people you'll, you'll understand right away, others don't reveal themselves fully for a while. So don't lay hands quickly on people because you want to know who labors among you. All right, so lasting change only results from above and below. On earth, right, you know, from the Lord's Prayer, on earth as it is in heaven. What about that prayer every morning? Rend open the heavens, Lord, and let it be on earth as it, is, as it is in heaven. At least the part that I can control. I can't control the whole world, but I have a uh, sphere of influence that I can influence. And when I talked to the person who received the food, they were shocked. Really? You have food that you can give to the families? Yeah, we do. And they said, yeah, but we talked to, I'm sorry, I don't mean to sound critical now, I'm just doing this for a reason. We talked to other churches and they said they couldn't help us unless we went to their church. And let's just cut those people some slack and say that's their, that's their choice. They can do it that way if they want to, right? But that left a pretty bad taste in this guy's mouth. And like, no, no, that's not, that's not what we're talking about. I just want to bring it to you and do what the Lord told us to do. Just help the people who need the help, and he'll work the rest of it out, right? Because he always does. And that's this next line that really stuck with me. Lack of the heaven and earth integration. Can we call it that? We're, we're integrating the kingdom of God into this earthly, sinful world that we all live in and, and deal with really difficult people on a regular basis. I'm not the only one, right? Nobody on the church staff I'm talking about here. I'm talking about my day job. <laughs> but we deal with difficult people, right? And if we don't integrate heaven and earth in our lives and in our responses and in our actions, that lack of integration results in disintegration. And I had never thought of the word disintegration as a lack of integration. <laughs> I didn't see it that way before, right? What's disintegrating? The culture. The culture is disintegrating all around us. And no offense if anybody here is a teacher, but I really don't like the idea that my tax dollars are being used to teach children that there's no difference between a boy and a girl biologically. I mean, like, you know, my father this year would have been 101, but like, you know, like, he would have thought he landed on a different planet. How is that even a discussion? A child who can't read knows there's a difference biologically between a man and a woman, right? This is in no way to disregard people who are dealing with that problem, okay? We're here to help them. But there's a place where you can get to where your empathy becomes a codependency. And you teach people that you're their answer. No, God is the answer. You don't protect people by bubble wrapping them, right? You protect people by letting them experience that you have more strength than you realize. Now, I'm not in favor of ever, ever showing bias towards anybody, okay? And if somebody has that sexual orientation issue, the only thing we should be thinking about is love, not shaming them, okay? But don't tell me that every kid in America has to have it built into their curriculum that they have to be taught that at a young age because some percentage of those kids are going to get confused when that topic would have never had to confuse them. And there's enough evidence that the teachers are doing it and not telling the parents. There you go. Disintegration. I really don't want to go there. 
with all these examples other than open your eyes, look at what's going on, and say, can I make a difference? You know what God's answer is? Yes, you can make a difference. You've got my word. You sense my presence in your life. You've been healed. Your mind has been opened up to the truth of the word of God. You understand spiritual things, and they don't yet until you help them. So let's just think about the world disintegrating around us, maybe partly because we're not doing our part to integrate the kingdom of God in this secular world that we live in, right? You could take your secular job and make it a ministry for the Lord. I now, I deputize every one of you here to be that marketplace minister, to be that person. Why would you leave Jesus in the car when you go to work? So you and I get off at 5 o'clock. I got to go to the real world. That's what people say all the time. Oh, that turn the other cheek stuff might work in the Bible, but I live in the real world. Yeah, well, Jesus lives in the real world, too. I'll be another day's teaching. Turn the other cheek does not mean be run over with a bulldozer. All right? We sang it. Push back. So it says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. It's easy to skip past preaching the gospel of the kingdom. But don't skip past the gospel of the kingdom. That was the main ministry of Jesus, was the gospel of the kingdom. It was about bringing the kingdom of God into the sinful world. Yes, salvation gets you through the door, but once you're in the door, now it's who does God want you to be? Each one of you, you can think of the verse, train up a child in the way he or she should go. Right? If you have more than one child, you know they're very different. What does God want for that person? Well, what about you? What does God want for each one of you? He wants you to find the thing that he made you for. He wants you to find why you were created. You hear that saying? The most important day is not the day you're born. It's the day you find out why you were born. <laughs> why were you born? To make no difference in the world? Right? Like good fruit or bad fruit? Like what's going to be? You're going to produce fruit one way or the other. Gospel of the kingdom. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Saying the, the availability of heaven is not far away. It's available in your job. It's available in your family. It's available in, in the most complicated situation that you're confused about. You ask the Lord and watch what he'll do. Drop ideas into your heart that you wouldn't have thought of on your own. And that, this is key for us. When he saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion for them. We're not always. We're not always. That's another way you could say, rend open the heavens, Lord. Open my heart to be compassionate. That doesn't mean, you know, you can't be overly compassionate because you can. But that's not what this says. They were like harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Harassed and helpless. This poor guy, like I said, he lost his wife. And he was like stunned. He was going through the motions, but he wasn't grounded back in reality yet of life. He was still grieving. And let's let people grieve. Let's talk to them and say, yeah, that must be really hard what you're going through. But what would your spouse want for you right now? What if she was here? What would she want for you? Not to be alone, not to be isolated, too much time to think. Verse 37, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. This should be convicting, but the workers are few. It should be convicting because all of us qualify as workers. And it doesn't have to be this big. You don't have to memorize everything. and You just have to be Jesus to the person you're interacting with in that moment, right? Let the Spirit of God rise up inside of us. Yes, you have to make deposits of the Word so you know what the Word says, but then translating it into action is easier than you think if you start trying. All right, so in, in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul said, if we act like fanatics, it's for God, but if we act in a coherent and reasonable way, it's for you. <laughs> Verse 14, you see, the controlling force in our lives is the love of the anointed one. And, and in another portion that you might read, a different translation, it says, the fuel, the thing that compels us, the thing that wakes me up in the morning and wants me to get out of bed is because God put his love in me for this crazy world that we live in. And I know he gave me a mission to go out and speak to other people because there's so much pain in the world. And Paul could have had many other jobs. He could have been a professor at the university. Clearly had enough of that, and yet he chose to still make tents. 
and be at the marketplace. And he would go to the Hall of Tyrannus at the lunch hour. He'd still have his apron on. When you make tents, you have an apron and you put your tools in the tent. And he would have a bandana on his head because he was sweating. It's hot over there, right? So now all of a sudden they said, well, look, where there's some sick people. We couldn't get them here, but can we borrow your apron and your handkerchief? Your sweatband? You want my sweatband? It's anointed. And they would take the apron and the handkerchief and drop it on the sick person and they'd get healed. What? Yes. Why? He knew who he was. He knew he didn't have to quit his day job to be a minister for the gospel. There was something about what he was doing while he was working that tent making job that caused people to get healed. You have that. I'm looking around. I know some of you are nurses and obvious, right? Like how much ministry opportunities you get because you're caring for very vulnerable people. But all of us, I mean, I can't say all of us. If you, if you're making adult X rated movies, you need to leave that job. Okay. That's not, that's not going to be the Lord. Right? You can witness to those people, but you get it. Like not every single job out there is going to allow you that, but, but nobody here is doing that to my knowledge. If you are, let's talk. <laughs> Paul says, the thing that wakes me up in the morning is God's love that he placed in me for other people, Christians and non-Christians. Christians will disciple them. The non-Christians will witness to them. Let them know what's available. And our confession is this. One died for all, therefore all died. He died for us so that we will all live. Not for ourselves, but for him who died and rose from the dead. So he doesn't just talk about the death on the cross. He also talks about the resurrection. And without the resurrection, man, I'll tell you what, we're, we got a big problem. Because he could take something away from you, like an addiction, Right, which you pray for, Lord, take it away. But you forget that on the other side of that addiction, you don't really know who to be. Because you got so used to making your decisions off of those addictions, so many lies, in the case of drug addiction at least. Well, what's it like now to, to tell the truth? I don't know how to do that because I'm a black belt in lying. But I'm a green belt on this side. And the people who love you will say, oh, no problem, we can help you tell the truth. That's what Paul wanted to do. Because of that, God, of what God has done, sorry, all of that God has done, we now have a new perspective. Can you say that with me? I have a new perspective. Because of what God has done for me. I don't look at the world the same way I used to look. Mm -mm. Because of what God has done, we now have a new perspective. We used to show regard for people based on the worldly standards and interests. So what kind of car do you drive? And what's the name of the college in the back of your windshield? RVCC. Great college. Raritan Valley Community College. But you don't see a lot of those stickers, do you? It's supposed to be Princeton. It's supposed to be Dartmouth. It's supposed to be an Ivy League school. Oh, well, you know, they must be important. Well, they're smart. We know that. You got to be smart to get in there. But let's, let's draw the line a little bit different here. What does God see? Man looks at the outside, but God looks at the heart. That's what God told Samuel when he was trying to pick which son of Jesse was going to be the king. We used to regard, look, and I'm not diminishing Ivy League schools. We have a son that goes to one, okay? So that's not my point. My point is don't judge people based on those surface things because there's plenty of wealthy people that are dealing with demons, and you can't buy your way out of demons. Sometimes the money makes it worse because they have so many other options. <laughs> Selah. We used to show regard for people based on worldly standards and interests. No longer. That's his answer. We have a different perspective now. That person who needs the food is not a loser. Get a job. What? You know nothing about this person. And this is what they tell us they hear when they go to other places. No, no, you're not a loser. You just need help right now. And look, if they are suffering, which would be the better way to get them to shift? By showing them the love of God or by shaming them? That's an easy answer. Look for every place Jesus shamed people in the Bible. <laughs> and it was only ever the religious spirit. 
for not showing the love of God. I don't even know if you'd say shimmy. He was doing his job. We used to think of Jesus, the anointed, the same way, no longer. <laughs> and this is where people would say, well, he was Jesus. You know, he had an unfair advantage. He was part God and part man. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. He could have sinned just like you and I. And if he couldn't have sinned, then it wasn't a temptation. So yes, he could have, but he didn't. And he put that spirit inside us so we don't have to sin. We could be strong enough to have the immune system in the spirit that we don't sin. Therefore, if anyone is united with the anointed one, Jesus, that person is a new creation. That person that I'm giving the food to, I'm just using this example because it's current right now, that might not have even wanted to come up and talk to me before, but now that we get to speak to each other, we have a kindred spirit. And, and it turns out that the guy I was talking to this week that was actually giving the food to the families isn't a Christian. Yet. <laughs> Yet. But he's got a heart to help people. And I met his brother. And, and they, um, you know, they have a business together. And, and the brother goes, yeah, you know, what he does, meaning helping people that he doesn't have to help. He says, it's good for business. <laughs> I mean, even the world is closer to the kingdom than you realize. They know that. You, know, you leave a little money on the table, one of my bosses used to say. Don't, don't squeeze every penny out of the people. Let them know that they understand how life is. Because if you do that to other people, they're going to do it to you. That's right out of the Sermon on the Mount. Judge not, lest you be judged. And with the same measure you judge, it will be measured back to you. Even the world gets this. I'm loving being with this group, this group of people. It's just there's a purity about it that they understand the gospel. All of this, right? The, the old is gone and the new has come. All this is a gift from God, our creator, who's pursued us and brought us into a restored and healthy relationship with him, the father, through his son, the anointed one. And he has given us the same mission. Sorry. Look at somebody now and say, he has given us the same mission. Right? This is not sit around and wait till the chariot comes down out of heaven to get us out of here. All right? No. He didn't do that. He was about the Father's business. And so should we be about the Father's business? See, he's given us the same ministry, which uh, mission, sorry, which is the ministry of reconciliation. All right, well, that's a big word, isn't it? To bring others back to him. Now, look, I hadn't read this verse prior to seeing that guy this week, but that's what I was trying to do. I was just trying to say, wow, you know, look at, look at what you're saying. You never met a person like your ex, your former wife. And, and you said the first thing you said about her was she was a born-again Christian and she lived what, what she talked about. She wasn't a hypocrite. <laughs> but now you're separated from that group of people. And he had reason to be, but, but no, no, push through. Don't let the devil hold you down. Push through. I hope he went, but I don't know. I hope I see him again. And you know I'm going to talk to him again. God is saying the mission isn't that hard. If you're trying, you can bring people to me. And, and especially when the culture is falling apart and disintegrating, when they see the integration of you with heaven, you'll stop that disintegration. There should be a scripture in there, huh? God was the anointed making things right between himself and the world. He doesn't hold their sins against them. Ouch. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> we do. He doesn't hold their sins against them, but we do. Don't. <laughs> That's deep. But it also means he charges us. There's that thing again, just like he's given us a mission. He charges us. We've been given a charge to proclaim the message that heals and restores our broken relationships with God and with each other. Anybody want to leave now without being rude? Because <laughs> wouldn't it be easier to just go to church and say, yeah, yeah, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, but Jesus is coming back. We made it another week. Dragging in. Man, it's a rough place out there. Give me a shot of vitamin B. The blood. I don't mean to make fun of anything. I'm just saying, like, life is so much better when you wake up and have a meaning for your life. That I'm a representative. I'm an ambassador for God's kingdom. I'm different than any other person. You don't have to be Peter. You don't have to be Trisha. You just have to be you. 
to the fullness. And really, our job is to help you be that, that son and daughter of the living God that God has called you to be. And a lot of people we meet are still wearing Saul's armor, right? They still are, are walking in an identity that somebody else tried to put on them. And we're like, no, you throw rocks with a slingshot, man. Get that stuff off because your gift is different than what the world told you. And saw, I mean, why would I want your armor? You didn't even want to go fight Goliath. So maybe some of that stink is on your armor. <laughs> the coward stink. Let's look at our handout. Everybody got one? This really helped me the first time I saw it. And I know what time it is, but it's good for you to have tools to use. And it's, it's a lot to go through. I won't go into too much detail. But again, it's like a map that is written from people that mentored me. And uh, we got some ushers if you didn't get one that have copies. Um, if you were trained in a church when you first got saved for evangelism, most of us probably learned about the Roman road, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you can be saved, right? I mean, I don't want to oversimplify. It's very important to do that. But it can turn into a little bit of a formula, and it's like push a button, and you say the same thing, irregardless of who's in front of you. Right? So if it's a hell's angel, you, you say the same thing as if it was, I don't know, a, a grandma that you're helping walk across the street. Right? Well, maybe not. Maybe those two people are very different. So part of this rend open heaven is to say, Lord, this person is completely different than any other person I've ever met in my life. I will never know the full story, and I don't need to. I just need to know what you want me to say right now in this interaction with them. Right? And then he'll show you more about that person. Well, what should the initial part be is listening. You got two ears and one mouth. <laughs> so listen twice as much as you talk, right? That's that equation. So that left side says, first of all, it says Engel's evangelism scale. The man's name was James Engel. I found out about him through Peter Wagner. Peter Wagner was a PhD at Fuller Theological Seminary, and he was teaching what's called missiology. It's about church growth. It's about how do we lead people to the Lord, right? College classes on it. And he was very good at it, but then he partnered with another man named John Wimber, who didn't just talk and teach the class. John Wimber prayed for people, and stuff happened. When John Wimber prayed, demons came out of people. They got healed. And that was, a, in addition to the understanding of Scripture, it was also a demonstration of the power. So Ken Fish is going to be here. Ken Fish was in the class at Fuller Theological Seminary as a teaching associate when that class was happening. And the college students that were PhD students, many coming off the missions field, they were getting demons cast out of them. And they didn't have any eschatology or, or theology for that. But look, it was obvious that something was going on here. There was some spiritual activity going on, right? And Cheon was in the class as a student. And Doris Wagner, who still, we're still friends with, was the person signing people in at the door. She had to call for a security guard because people were trying to sneak into the class to see the miracles that were happening. There should be people trying to sneak into church. Right? Not to see demons cast. I would see miracles happening. But demons too. You don't have to take them with you when you leave. So what's God's role is on the left side. That's, that spells out steps. And, and if you look at this, it's kind of like a ladder. At the top of the page is somebody who's the farthest away from God. And, you know, for lack of a better example, let's just say a hell's angel, right? One of, one of the motorcycle gang people who kind of just turned away from everything and, and is dealing drugs or whatever, right? No awareness of a supreme being, but no effective knowledge of that of that God. And and I'm here to tell you, you should speak differently to that person than somebody who's further down, right? And you have to be willing to to ask the Lord and say, okay, this is different. I wasn't expecting this. I've never talked to somebody like this. Let somebody else do it. I don't have the anointing for that. I don't have the grace for that. Now that could be true, but. Push through a little. Try. A seven, you know, a person minus seven. Again, what's God's role is a general revelation at that point when they're that far away from God. 
And what's our role as a communicator is just to say, no, there's another way. You're proclaiming the gospel. You're saying, well, I know you bought into the system that the world teaches us. And I know that system because I was in it and I understand it. But have you ever considered that there's another way? And they might remember seeing the movie, I don't know, with Charlton Heston about Moses or Jesus on the cross. They have some vague understanding that it's out there, but you know, just an awareness and an initial awareness of the gospel when you tell them. And here's a typical thing those people would say is, well, I'm glad that truth works for you, but I got my own truth. <laughs> and Jesus said, I am the truth. The way, the truth, and the life. So, hey, all we can do is ask the Lord to open the heaven over our lives, and then I open my mouth, you fill it, Lord. And then an initial awareness of the fundamentals of the gospel. And now look at God's role changes when you get to number five, from general revelation to what? Conviction. Conviction. <laughs> right? He's really good at this one. Not condemnation. Not shaming, just that conviction of, ooh, I'm leaving. You know, the person hears it and they're like, well, the, there's a flight mechanism that kicks in because why? They're grasping the implications of the gospel at number five. And what do they do? What's on that little sidebar there? Rejection. <laughs> and then they move from minus five to minus four where they say, well, maybe there is something to what you're saying. I married this woman, thought, hated Christians, but... I never met anybody like her. And every day he's being faced with this like opposition, but man, but it's working like whatever she's doing. Like it never been anybody like this. And through that, he comes, in this case, to his own personal problem recognition. Then makes a decision. And that's where our role changes from just being a proclaimer of it to persuasion. And there's a million ways I could try to demonstrate this to you, but, but the main theme I'm just trying to say is that when you look at somebody, this is what C.S. Lewis says, you're never just looking at an average person. There's no such thing as an average human being. Everybody you look at was created in God's image. There's no, Peter said, I perceive that you're no respecter of persons. Doesn't matter what's on the label of the car that you drive or what university is on the back windshield or how well you speak or how poorly you speak or what language you speak. He says there's not one should perish. Not one. And okay, maybe that sounds like a big assignment, but we read it. He's given us a message of reconciliation so that the broken relationships can be healed. You guys good with me hanging in there? Because then on the other side, after they accept the Lord, it's also very important. We can go over this part another day. But to be discipled when you become a Christian, to be discipled. Am I more like Jesus today than I was yesterday? And am I more like him this year than I was last year? And how about when I first got saved? Yes. Thank you, Lord. Is, am, I, am I increasing in my Christ-likeness or have I hit a plateau? And if I've hit a plateau, something needs to die. He said, pick up your cross weekly, monthly, daily. So look, you know, if you're willing to, he'll show you the next thing he wants us to work on. Amen? You guys okay? I'll just go quickly. Last part here. The rest of Isaiah, we started in, in verse 1 where he said, rend the heavens and come down. And then this is what that verse 3 says. We remember that long ago you did amazing things for us that we had never dreamed that you would do. You came down and the mountain shook at your presence. This is when Moses was getting the Ten Commandments. Remember that scene? They heard trumpets. They saw fire, clouds, smoke coming off the mountain. And they said, look, we don't want to go talk to him. Moses, you go. They were a little intimidated by that. You came down the mountain, shook at your presence. Nothing like that had ever happened before. No eye had ever seen no ear had ever heard such wonders, but you did them for the sake of your people, for those who trusted in you. You meet whoever tries. Oh, right? <laughs> it's very convicting, isn't it? You meet whoever tries to meet you, you'll meet them. No matter what pit they were in, no matter how a hell hole of hell holes, if they're trying, you'll meet them. 
I had to stop it there. That's not the full sentence. You meet whoever tries with sincerity of purpose to do what you want, to do justice and follow in your ways. And then in, in the Message Bible, it says, take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called into this Christian life. I don't see many of the brightest and best among you. Not many influential. Not many from high society families. You know, you probably heard this verse, God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Anybody beside me in that group? Okay, good. The rest of you are lying. No, kidding, kidding, just kidding. Come on, make sure you're awake. It isn't, isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses? <laughs> Choose the nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. <laughs> it is, it's so shallow. And then he says, my, my speech to the Corinthians, my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. Now that means a lot to Paul because he could have impressed you. He had a lot of knowledge. No, in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. That's how we're all supposed to be living. It's not just supposed to be, I'll pray for you, you know, someday. No, I want to pray for you right now and I want to see you healed. Why shouldn't we do that? Because we're afraid maybe we'll look bad. Well, you know, give that way of thinking up. Just do what he asks you to do. Pray for them. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age. Those are coming to nothing. But as it is written in Isaiah 64, 4 that we just read, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So we were with a guy named John Ramirez who was deeply steeped in witchcraft and God turned his life around from being an opponent of the gospel to now being a preacher of the gospel. All right, like no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no, the heart of man hasn't conceived it. What God has prepared for those who love him, but God. Can you say, but God? You stand up. Come on, that's a good one to stand up on. But God. Oh, my life is the best, but God. <laughs> right? Whew, my kids couldn't find him, but God. Put a Christian in their path. But God made himself real. Rabbi Zacharias, I know he had a bad ending, but boy, I'll tell you what, his testimony was amazing. He was dying on a bed, and, and Jesus appeared to him in the hospital room. He wanted to commit suicide. Like, but God, it's just too big. You can't even fill it up. So even though no eye has ever seen it or heard it, God has revealed them to us. These things that we couldn't even imagine, God has revealed them to us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, even the deep things of God. So I saw some hands going up. Could you just do this act of surrender to the Lord and say, I don't want to be walking around in this natural, carnal realm. I want to be one of these people that keeps you in tune all day of every day. And I want you to reveal the deep things of God to me, even in secular situations. I still need your advice. I still need to do it your way, not my way, not the convenient way, but your way. The deep things of God. For what, what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Can you just thank him for that? Thank you, Lord, that these have been freely given. They're free to us, but it wasn't free to you. You gave your life. You gave your life. You went to the cross knowing you were going to die in order to release the Spirit of God into the earth. Can you imagine going to that cross, loving us enough to know that when he resurrected, the Holy Spirit would be poured out on the whole earth? That was the key. Adam had it in the garden. They sinned that shut it out. Jesus was the second Adam, the final Adam. He raises from the dead. And now God just sends the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And now, whosoever will can be filled with the Spirit. What would you rather have, five degrees or the Holy Spirit? Not even close. Having both wouldn't be bad. Thank you. I agree. A person who walks by the Spirit examines everything. This is my last slide. 
examines everything, sizing it up and seeking out the truth. That's kind of where I was going with my chart up here, right? First of all, who am I talking to? Is it a minus eight or is it a minus two? It makes a big difference, right? You have to have an awareness. And look, you're not always going to be right, so you start out by believing the best about everybody that you're talking to, right? And then as you're interacting and you're talking, you're just listening. This is what Jesus did with the woman at the well, right? He knew she had lived with five men before, but he didn't slam her with that. He just talked to her. He built a relationship. And every time they speak, they're giving you another idea that, that's filling in the picture, and that's what discernment is about. And that's, that's what the Spirit of God in you is doing. It's keeping you alert and awake. And how about marriages? I think we could use a little more discernment in marriages. Oh, you better say yes louder if you want a bagel. I'm telling you. Yes! We need more in our marriages and all of our relationships. A person who walks by the Spirit examines everything, sizing it up and seeking out the truth. It's not too much work, man. I'm going to tell you that the results are just way, way better. The scripture asks in Isaiah 40, verse 3, does anyone know the mind of the Lord well enough to become his advisor? <laughs> but we possess the mind of Christ. That's a pretty big responsibility, don't you think? So I just want to bless you that everything that we read about today and, and spoke about, that you, there would be a, a keen awareness in your hearts that, that it's a good prayer to say, Lord, rend open the heavens over my life every day, over my family, over my job. I don't want to operate on the thinking of this carnal world full of sin, and it's so easy for that to happen. You, you get submerged into that sinful way of thinking in your, on your job, and all of a sudden they're impacting you when you're there to be impacting them. So that's why you pray. That's why you fast. That's why you say, Lord, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to influence them for the good. They're not going to influence me for the bad. Amen? We possess the mind of Christ. Yes, the Lord is beyond our comprehension, but he gave us his spirit and the truth of his word that we can navigate our way on this mission that he gave us. So, Lord, if you're willing, just raise your hand. I'm willing to be that minister of reconciliation. I'm willing to be that person who will bring people back to you, who will help mend the broken relationships that exist all around us, and it seems like more and more every day based on all the things going on in our culture. But Lord, but we want to be change agents. We want to be people that are bringing light into darkness and bringing life to dead situations and giving people hope that have been hopeless. And however you choose to use us, Lord, we say we are here, available. Here I am, send me. Can you say that? Here I am, send me. And Lord, I bless your people as they go about their business today. It's not just theirs, it's your business. That we would be people of power. Demonstration of power. Not just fancy words, but demonstration of the Spirit of God and of the power of God. That we might see many that we love, that are far from you, come into the kingdom of God. Come in and be freed from drug addictions and, and, and just disastrous sexual behavior that they have. That they would be cleansed and healed and renewed and restored and come into your kingdom to be who you called them to be. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.